Okay, and with that, I would like to officially uh, welcome everybody to this evening's Geostrategy in the Grassroots uh, webinar. My name is Benjamin Pachter. I am the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Central Ohio. And on behalf of JASCO, as well as our partners for tonight's event, the Ohio State University Institute for Japanese Studies, we are very excited and honored to be presenting to you what is sure to be a very insightful and thought-provoking um, discussion and series of presentations dealing with the continually important uh, relationship and partnership between the United States and Japan, specifically as it relates to some of the uh, political, uh, strategic, and um, economic ties that continue to bring our two nations together, particularly in terms of recent developments on many different fronts. Uh, before we get started, I introduce our guests. Uh, there are some organizations that I would like uh, to thank because with, without them, we cannot be having this event today. Uh, beginning with the two sponsoring organizations of the Geo Strategies and the Grassroots Series. That is uh, the, the National Association of Japan America Societies and the president of NAJAS, uh, Peter Kelly, will be uh, speaking in a moment, as well as the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Now, I've noticed in the attendee list that we have several individuals from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation with us tonight. For So thank you all so much for your support. We're really excited to be offering an ADO strategy in the grassroots event for two years in a row. Um, while unfortunately we were not able to hold it uh, again in person this year, um, we're hoping for that opportunity soon. And we're very happy that nevertheless, we can take advantage of uh, all the technologies at our uh, fingertips to be able to still provide such an amazing uh, topic and discussion for us all. I would also like to take a moment to maybe uh, point everyone's attention to a few events that we have coming up that are actually tied uh, to our uh, sponsors, to our partners, and, and to this discussion in, in some way, shape, or form, actually. Um, on the JASCO side, on the OSU side, and on the NEJAS side. Um, beginning, if I may, a little bit selfishly with some upcoming JASCO events that we have coming. Um, at the end of next month, on Friday, March 25th, uh, JASCO is uh, very excited to be once again partnering with uh, National Association of Japan American Societies, as well as uh, in this particular instance, the, uh, the Keizai Koho Center, which is a branch of the Keidanren, the uh, Japan Business Federation, to be offering a special uh, business update um, surrounding the latest uh, activities and plans of um, American Honda Motor Company. Uh, especially given that this year is the 45th anniversary of the signing of the agreement between Ohio and Honda for Honda Motor Company to uh, build a first a motorcycle plant and then a automobile plant in Marysville, Ohio, just outside of Columbus. Um, and then it is also the 40th anniversary of the rolling of the first accord off of the Marysville auto plants line. It's a very exciting time for us to be able to explore the history of Honda in Ohio, which of course impacts not just Ohio, but the entire United States as it relates to automobile manufacturing in Japan. Um, but also look forward to what's going on and we're very excited to be hosting that. And we're actually very excited that it's gonna be one of the first uh, in-person events that we'll hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be holding again uh, at the end of next month. So that is an in-person event and we are actually still at the same time trying to see if it is possible to stream that. Um, so we're working with the venue to see the potentiality of that. If you are local and you're interested in the topic, we hope you can join us, space is limited. Um, but if you're not, you're not able to join us, please look to our website for the potential of, of having uh, those presentations streamed. Uh, then the following month on April 21st, uh, we are actually, that is JASCO, celebrating our 25th anniversary. Um, and is deeply tied to what is going on right now because we have deep ties to our partners, Ohio State University Institute for Japanese Studies. Um, and of course, with the support of NAJAS, it's 25 years of JASCO actually being officially part of NAJAS. Um, so if you're in the area, please check out our website because it's uh, exciting. We will be honoring um, Honda's actually contributions to US-Japan relations in Ohio, but we're also going to be hon honoring one of our uh, former board members, Dr. Bradley Richardson, um, who is uh, unfortunately uh, no longer with us, but he is a former, not only board member of JASCO, but also uh, the original uh, director of the Institute for Japanese Studies at Ohio State University. Uh, and this actually ties to the fact where next week is actually the um, IJS annual Brad Richardson Memorial Lecture. 
Uh, so next week, uh, Monday, February 21st, is the annual Brad Richardson Memorial Lecture. Uh, this is going to be held um, online. Uh, it is featuring a, a um, exploration of cultural ambassadorships in contemporary Japan by Christine Yano, who is a professor of anthropology at University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, it also is going to include a post-lecture discussion by uh, Dr. Mani Noda, um, a um, instructor, uh, professor of Japanese at OSU, and also a actually a JASCO board member. So there's a nice synergy across all of these. So we hope you can join us for that as well. Uh, finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is part of the Geo Strategy in the Grassroots uh, series that is supported by NAJAS as well as the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Uh, after ours, there are a number of uh, ones coming up. Um, um, last night actually was one in Toronto with the Japan Society in Canada. Uh, next week, I'm oh, sorry, next month on March 22nd, uh, the Japan American Society of Atlanta will be hosting a geo strategy and a grassroots event. And the following day on March 23rd, um, I have to check those dates. I'm maybe one day off. But um, I believe that, uh, yes, the Japan American Society of Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh will also be. Um, hosting a geo strategy and a grassroots event. So if you like the topics that you've heard today, and you maybe like to get a different perspective in terms of different speakers, everyone has amazing speakers. So we hope you, if you, you can enjoy not only our uh, perspectives that we receive from our amazing guests, but also uh, theirs as well. And to that end, we are of course, uh, greatly relying upon and enjoying the wonderful network that we have within NAJAS. And I would like at this time to uh, turn the mic over briefly to uh, the president of, uh, of NAJAS, uh, Peter Kelly, to give us a few introductory remarks uh, uh, before we introduce our uh, guests for the evening. So please, Peter. Thank you, Ben. And uh, to reverse the title of the, of the old movie, Hello Columbus. I'm Peter Kelly from the National Association of Japan America Societies in Washington, D.C. There are 38 Japan America Societies located all over North America. All of them, like JASCO, are locally, locally funded and locally managed, and they exist to promote people-to-people -people ties between Japan and the United States at the local level. It's a wonderful network, one of the largest private networks that support a bilateral relationship that the U.S. has with any other country. We thank the Japan America Society of Central Ohio and, and, and Ben for hosting this, this program. The work of NAGIS is to help Japan America societies to strengthen the network by providing Japan related programs to our member societies. We offer with, with, uh, with partnering foundations, we offer six different programs, a public affairs program, a strategy program, which this is, this is one, two business speaker programs, one of which is with Kay Don Ren, and when Ben <coughs> described earlier the the uh, the Honda episode uh, event coming up, that is from the uh, the business speaker series, one cultural program and a security oriented program. All of those are competitive, and so we congratulate the Japan America Society of Central Ohio for being selected for this program. The Geo Strategy series we started four years ago, in partnership with the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan. Geostrategy is close to the heart of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And with the two of us got together, the idea was to promote an understanding of the geostrategic challenges that both the United States and Japan face in Asia. And we do that by having a, a speaker from Japan and a speaker from the United States there, who can have a discussion about about those, those issues, highlighting their perspectives, not the perspectives of the governments, because our speakers are all, are all private citizens, not representatives of the government, but they offer a perspective from the US side and from the Japan side about the strategy, about the issues that the two countries face and how they are working together. The, uh, there are eight of these events this year. This is the third. Each has a different set of speakers. And so as Ben said, you can tune in to different events and get different perspectives. The next one is actually next week in, um, in Southern Colorado. And the, the theme of that will be space. We all know that the space is, is an area where um, of strategic competition. And that's also the headquarters of the US Space Command. So the, uh, tonight's interview, tonight's uh, uh, speakers are both ambassadors. 
I'm not sure what you, how you title a group of ambassadors. Is it a fleet of ambassadors? If so, we have a fleet of ambassadors tonight, ambass one from the United States and one from Japan. We look very much look forward to, uh, to hearing them. The speakers are the, are the key for these events. And we are very grateful to Ambassador Shear and Ambassador Ishii for, for joining us tonight. Uh, to introduce them, let me give the microphone back to Ben. Thank you, Peter. Yes, it's it's my um, extreme honor to be able to introduce our two um, guests who are joining us virtually from uh, both sides of the Pacific um, today. Uh, we are begin begin by um, introducing Ambassador uh, David Shear. And so, if if you give me a moment to uh, be able to read uh, just a, a fraction of his um, uh, distinguished uh, bio and career. Uh, presently, Ambassador Shear is an adjunct professor at the John Hopkins. School of Advanced International Studies. He performed the duties of Principal Deputy uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Policy from June 2016 to January 2017. He was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs from September 2014 to June 2016. Uh, prior of to 2014, uh, Ambassador Shear served for 32 years in the American Foreign Service, most recently as the United States Ambassador to Vietnam. He has also served in Sapporo, um, Beijing, Tokyo, and Kuala Lumpur. In Washington, he has served in the offices of Japanese, Chinese, and Korean affairs, and as the special assistant to the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. He was director of the Office of Chinese and Mongolian Affairs in 2008-2009, and served as deputy assistant uh, secretary in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2009 to 2011. Um, well, also, it's slightly to the west of here, but um, Ambassador Shear is a, a graduate of Earlham College, um, um, and Sias, of course, and he has attended Waseda University, Taiwan National University, and Nanjing University. Um, and he is a recipient of the State Department Superior Honor Award and Defense Department's uh, Civilian uh, Material Service Awards. Um, and on perhaps a related or unrelated note, he also has a first degree rank in Kendo, which is the Japanese art of uh, swordsmanship. So I am very honored to uh, present as our first speaker for the evening, uh, Ambassador David Shear. Thank you very much, Ben. And thanks to JASCO, NAJAS, and Sasakawa Peace Foundation for sponsoring this event tonight and for inviting me to uh, join you all tonight. It's a great honor. And I'd like to start by congratulating JASCO on its 20th anniversary on behalf of NAJAS. Thank you very much for all of, all of the things you've done to contribute to uh, stronger US-Japan ties. And before I start, I just wanna make it clear that a first degree rank in Kendo is the lowest rank, not the highest rank in Kendo. The highest rank is eight, and I have a long way to go before I achieve anything close to that. Um, I'm gonna to talk tonight about um, uh, the American Indo-Pacific strategy and its relationship to the US-Japan alliance. And uh, before I start, I'm gonna uh, bring up my PowerPoint slides, if you'll bear with me just one moment. Can everybody see that? Good about the Indo-Pacific re region, and there you see it stretching from the west coast of the United States all the way through East Asia to the east coast of Africa. It's an immense region. And on this map, you can see all those dots representing a cargo vessel on one day in May of 2012. Most major cargo vessels are equipped with position uh, uh, devices that uh, relay their position to the International Maritime Union. And there you have every cargo vessel, every tanker, car carrier, dry bulk carrier, and liquid carrier on the ocean with a position device in May of 2012, courtesy of shipmap.org. I recommend that you go see that. It's a fascinating map. But this gives you a sense of just how important to the international uh, economy uh, the Indo-Pacific region is, even those uh, incredibly dense uh, sea lanes of communication. And the United States, of course, historically, particularly in the Pacific, is a maritime power 
So those sea lines of communication are of, are of vital interest to the United States. Keeping them open and free is a vital interest of the United States. And we have linked the Indian and Pacific Oceans together because of the growing importance, strategic and economic importance of the Indian Ocean, because of the growing importance uh, of India and of all of the linkages between, uh, the important linkages between regions symbolized there by all that, uh, those bright lines moving through the Malacca Strait. So the Indo-Pacific region is of, uh, uh, of incredible importance to the United States and we've recognized that most recently in a February 11 document issued by the White House called the Indo-Pacific Strategy. And that, that document, I'm gonna talk about that document tonight. That document um, uh, uh, ex uh, emphasizes the, the, the new importance we place on the Indo-Pacific region. The US is an Indo-Pacific power and the region has vast economic resources. It's home to more than half of the world's people, nearly two thirds of the world's economy and seven of the world's largest militaries including the Chinese and Japanese militaries. Uh, the, mo much of the world's trade and much of the world's oil flows through the Malacca Strait and the South China Sea on to not only our allies, Japan and South Korea, but to China as well. So this is vital, a vital, vitally uh, important region strategically, not only to our allies, but to China also. And the, the Pacific, Indo-Pacific strategy issued by the White House recognizes the challenges we face in the region, particularly the challenge posed by the rise of China. The, uh, the strategy states that the PRC is combining its military, economic, and diplomatic and te technological might to pursue a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific and to become the world's most influential power. We can live with uh, China as a global, globally influential power. It would be difficult for us to live with a China that casts a sphere of influence over the entire East Asian and Indo-Pacific regions. Uh, uh, th that is something that would be difficult for the United States to accept. I believe it would be difficult for Japan to accept as well. And that's why both Japan and the United States uh, are pursuing what they call Indo-Pacific strategies. And there we see uh, uh, evidence of increased Chinese military activities in the East China Sea. This is a map published by the Japanese Ministry of Defense. Um, and you, you see um, uh, uh, enormous, an enormous increase over the past few years in Chinese military operations in those uh, key areas in the East China Sea, particularly the strategic straits between Taiwan and Okinawa and between the uh, uh, Amami Oshima Islands and Kyushu. Uh, enormously strategic area. Um, we see the Chi Chinese Belt and Road Initiative de designed to integrate the economies of countries around China's periphery uh, economically with China and to extend Chinese, not only Chinese economic influence, but diplomatic influence throughout the whole area surrounding China. Um, the, the, the uh, Maritime Silk Road through Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean, and the, uh, the land bridges to, to Europe through Central, Central Asia. Uh, it's a $160 billion infrastructure project uh, or set of projects uh, being uh, uh, funded and to some extent managed by the Chinese throughout these regions. So the Chinese have become very assertive, very active uh, throughout the region, sometimes doing so in ways that are consistent with our own interests, sometimes doing so in ways that are not so consistent, and in fact, can be in conflict with our own interests. And our objective, according to the, uh, the new strategy, is not to change the, uh, the PRC, not to change China, 
but to shape the strategic environment in which it operates. We want to build a balance of power that is maximally favorable to the United States and to our allies and partners. We also want to manage competition with China uh, responsibly. We want to look for ways of uh, cooperating with China where we can. We want to, we will be, as um, Secretary of State Blinken says, we will, we will compete with China uh, uh, where we must. Um, and, and to do that, to, to uh, establish that favorable balance of power, um, we want to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific region in which uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific region can make decisions on their own, uh, in which they don't have to accommodate themselves to uh, any one great power, particularly China, uh, and uh, a region in which if they want to, they can say no to China and survive. And we want to build connections with and beyond the region, particularly with our allies, but but also with new partners uh, like Vietnam and Indonesia and India. We want to help drive regional prosperity. The United States wants to help drive regional prosperity. Uh, and the, the administration has proposed a new, uh, or is in the process of devising a new uh, economic framework um, through which we will, we will um, uh, interact economically with the region. We want to bolster Indo-Pacific security by strengthening our deterrence by strengthening our military posture and uh, increasing our cooperation with our allies uh, and, our, and our new uh, and developing partners. And finally, we wanna build regional resilience to transnational threats like COVID. We have pursued a very uh, active uh, COVID diplomacy throughout the region since 2020 um, and climate change. And we've, we've uh, sought cooperation with our Eastern allies and friends on climate change. Uh, as well, particularly since uh, the Biden administration came on board. We used to pursue all goals like that in the region by pursuing primacy, by drawing a line of a pretty solid line of defense down that first island chain, down that island archipelago off the Chinese, off the Chinese coast by establishing strong alliances with capable and reliable allies, stationing military forces on the territory of those allies and, um, and bringing all of our, our persuasive force to bear on the problems of the region, including North Korea, including the problem of uh, the Taiwan Strait, including South, the South China Sea, um, but it's getting, more and more difficult to do that along parts of, of this line. We're, we're still very solid in Northeast Asia. Northeast Asia is pretty stable. Uh, the North Korea, the North South Korea confrontation remains stable despite uh, numerous North Korean provocations over the years, including missile and nuclear tests. The Taiwan Strait remains pretty stable despite increased Chinese military intimidation across the strait. Uh, I'm, I don't think uh, war in the Taiwan Strait is uh, either inevitable or imminent. Um, I, I, think, I think the situation is stable and it will be as long as we can generate enough, as long as we can generate strong deterrent pow power throughout the region and in the area um, around the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but, uh, the, the, the line of defense is looking less certain in, throughout Southeast Asia. The Philippines and Thailand are less rely, reliable as allies. They're hedging between the United States and China. They, they're not interested in choosing between the two of us, and we can't count on them for the kind of cooperation that we could count on, for which we could count on them in the past. So that line of defense is, is a lot fuzzier in Southeast Asia. Australia is still a very strong ally, and I can talk about that in questions and answers. Um, in fact, it's stronger than ever. Um, but we have to find new ways of bringing our influence to bear uh, in the region, particularly in Southeast Asia. And that's what the Indo-Pacific strategy is all about. In a word, we can't go it alone. 
Um, and there you see the four major players on our side uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, President Biden, of course, Indian Prime Minister Modi and former Prime Minister Suga of Japan um, during a quadrilateral, quad, uh, quadrilateral summit in Washington held just last September. We can't go it alone. We need to cooperate much more uh, intensively with our allies. Our allies need to build their own uh, capabilities and they, they need to cooperate on them. And Japan is a particularly important ally in this regard. It's a thriving democracy. We have a common interest in a free and open Indo-Pacific region. In fact, Prime Minister Abe coined the phrase Indo-Pacific strategy during a speech in East Africa in 2016. The Trump administration embraced that, as has the Biden administration. Japan is the world's third largest economy. It has the world's second best Navy. It's not as big as our Navy. It's not as big as China's Navy, but qualitatively, it's the second best Navy in the world after the US Navy. Japan provides the US with forward bases, has done so for 70 years and will likely do so um, for as long as our interests coincide in the region. And Japan provides us with over $2 billion in host nation support to support the presence of our forces there uh, in our bases in Japan. So Japan's a good ally. We have lots of reasons for being an ally of Japan. We have strong historical connections, strong family ties with our, our large Japanese American community. Uh, we have strong ide ideational ties because we're democracies, intimate economic relations. But when you're talking about strategy, you're talking about power. And that's when you think about how we use our alliance with Japan to get what we want in the region. And the Japanese, when they think about strategy and the application of power, they think about how they can use their alliance with the US to get what they want. We have strong common interests. We're pulling in the same direction, but we need more. We need greater allied capabilities. In Japan's case, we need Japan to spend more on defense. We need Japan to modernize and expand its, its uh, military capabilities. Uh, we, we need stronger allied leadership, including from Japan, and closer cooperation among the US and its allies. Closer networking. Our alliances with Japan are bilateral alliances, unlike the multilateral alliance with NATO and Europe. So we're working hard to get those allies to work more closely together and go beyond the, the bilateral uh, alliance ties. And we're getting stronger Japanese regional economic leadership. They saved the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement when the US pulled out of that uh, arrangement in 2017. We pulled out of it for lots of domestic, political and economic uh, reasons, but strategically speaking, it was a blunder. Japan saved our bacon. They came to the rescue of the TPP and it, it has reformed itself as the uh, contra, uh, Comprehensive Partnership or CPTPP now with all of its original members except the United States. Uh, we've seen a greater Japanese uh, effort to strengthen its regional partnerships with countries like Vietnam and Indonesia and with Taiwan as well. And we've seen more robust Japanese military operations throughout the region. Japan now has uh, four uh, uh, helicopter carriers, that, some of which will be converted to aircraft carriers. So, um, so, and we operate very closely with the Japanese Navy. So that will strengthen uh, the, the way in which we can bring our influence to bear throughout the region. Um, we're also getting enlarged cooperation among our allies and partners. We're getting stronger cooperation between the US and its allies through the Quad, quad US, Japan, Australia, and India, through US, Japan, stronger uh, US, Japan, ROK ties, uh, uh, Japan, India, co str stronger J Japanese cooperation with India, with Australia, and in Southeast Asia. There remain weaknesses. Uh, or weak spots in the American strategy. One is that the American economic strategy
has yet to be fully articulated by the Biden administration. We've got to find a substitute for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the, the administration has yet to do that. Secondly, other regions have a vote. We're a global power. We have priorities all over the globe, and right now the priority is the Ukraine. And I'm sure that the White House and the National Security Council staff are spending almost all of their time on Ukraine, not on the Indo-Pacific. That will change. We have difficulty shifting resources from one region to another, even though we've pulled out of Afghanistan and we've significantly reduced forces in Iraq and Syria, moving military resources to the, to the, the Indo-Pacific region is difficult and time consuming. It's like turning a tanker, an oil tanker. Um, finally, um, we've had a hard time appointing ambassadors to the region. For almost a year, we didn't have five ambassadors in the 10 uh, uh, ASEAN countries. We still don't have ambassadors, an ambassador in Seoul. Um, uh, it, it, it takes administrations a long time to appoint ambassadors to get Senate confirmation. That's a weakness in our diplomatic practice. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to um, Ambassador Ishii. But first to Ben. Thank you very much, Dave. Yes, at this point, if I can um, have the honor to be able to introduce uh, Ambassador Ishii very quickly before turning over the spotlight to him. So uh, real quick before I say so, some have already taken advantage of it, uh, but if you have any questions for either of the speakers today, please feel free to uh, write them in the Q&A function and we will be sure to address them after uh, a brief uh, conversation between the two of them that will follow uh, Ambassador Ishii's presentation but for of course the aforementioned ambassador Ishii. Uh, so if you um, give me one moment to be able to uh, uh, do my best to properly introduce ambassador Ishii. Uh, ambassador uh, Masafumi Ishii was the ambassador of Japan to Indonesia uh, until 20, uh, December 2020 and uh, recently retired from Japanese Foreign Service in January 2021 uh, having served there for more than 40 years. He graduated from Tokyo University and joined uh, MOFA in 1980. His posts in Tokyo included director for policy planning, a, separate, a special assistant to the foreign minister, uh, and director uh, general for global issues and legal advisor. His oversee experience covers Washington DC where he served twice, London, Belgium, and NATO as the ambassador. His last po post was in Jakarta uh, that lasted for four years. He has frequently participated in international seminars and symposia and is well known for his policy planning insight as well as his long-term experience in working with partners from ASEAN uh, countries. Uh, presently, uh, Ambassador Ishii is teaching international law at Gakushin University, as well as providing advice to some of uh, some Japanese private companies. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, virtually to uh, Central Ohio um, Ambassador uh, Masafumi Ishii. Thank you, Ben, for that uh, nice introduction. Good evening, everybody, and uh, good morning from Japan. And uh, thank you, Peter, for joining us from Washington, D.C. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the same uh, uh, webinar with, uh, with Dave, who is a very good friend of mine for the past uh, 20 to 30 years, at least from my side. Um, I, I will, um, perhaps what I, I'm going to do is to zoom out a little bit from uh, where uh, Dave ended, and, and then talk about uh, the situation we are going to face in uh, 20, 10 to 20 years. And then from that, uh, I try to extract some of the common challenges of Japan and the United States. Let me share the, the my slides. Uh, by the way, I, I we, Japanese government has already uh, welcomed the new uh, US strategy for Indo-Pacific. Sorry, I, I cannot start the slideshow. Oops. Just a minute.
Anyway, I cannot st start the slideshow, but uh, I'll move it myself. Um, actually, uh, I, we took note that the new US uh, strategy for Indo-Pacific region was announced uh, even while the, the tension was very high in Ukraine. So uh, it's a little bit different from the way they described the situation in Washington, DC, where I think while being concentrated on, on uh, Ukraine, which you have to, I think your nerve, nerve of the US administration is not cut off, cut away from other regions, including Indo-Pacific, which we really welcome very much. Now, what I'm going to tell you is the Japan-US alliance towards 2050 and common geopolitical geostrategic challenges. First part, uh, global prospect towards 2050, what, what's going to happen in, uh, in uh, 10 to 20 years? I, in my view, uh, US is still the only superpower for now. If you compare the GDP and defense spending of US, China, and Japan, GDP of the United States is still 1.5 times more than that of China. And defense spending, I, you know, US takes care of 40% of the global defense spending aggregated, and which is two, two and a half times more than that of China. So US is still the only superpower for now, which is ready to get engaged with uh, global issues, global problems, wherever you are called up, you, you go there and then you solve the problem. But in 20 to 30 years, around 2040 to 2050, I think the situation will be a little bit different. Uh, by then, GDP and defense spending of China and the United States will be more or less in the same level, at least nominally. That doesn't mean that uh, US, China will be as prosperous as the United States. They have more population and China will not be militarily as uh, st strong as the United States because they have a vast country to defend. Um, so, it, but you know, it, it does mean that uh, US has been on the top on number one for in both in terms of GDP and defense spending in the past uh, 150 years, I think. Uh, now, China will be more or less on the same level, which has a very big symbolic meaning. So it does sound like a G2, which means the world will be dominated, governed by uh, the United States and the China, two countries, G2. But uh, around the same timing, actually, India comes up. India's population will become more than that of China, and aging of China will, start, will be very hard at that time, and the Chinese population is going to start declining after that. So I think the situation will be what I described by G3, which means US and China and India. These are the three superpowers, uh, which each of which has some say on the future of the of the, of the world around that time, G3. But if you look down a little bit, uh, who will be in the second tier? Uh, if you, we try to form new G7, seven influential countries uh, around that time, 2040 to 2050, I think uh, by then the GDP ranking will be number one, China, two US, then India actually, then Indonesia and Japan. So I, I think G7 will be will consist of G3 plus Japan, Indonesia, and the rest two are not very important, but I think Europe, if they stay united, and Russia, whether you like it or not, they are, they are very important and they cannot be ignored, as you can see from what's happening in, in Ukraine. So these are the countries which will likely to form uh, the, the new G7 around the year 2040 to 50. We should bear this kind of uh, macro situation in mind in talking about common challenges of our two countries. Now, oops. Um, what Japan sees as our common challenges, uh, I have only three more, three more slides, so bear with me. Number one, uh, Strengthen Japan-US alliance for maintaining global and regional stability and prosperity under new and more complex circumstances. Um, as as uh, Dave, was Dave was saying, I think uh, US, well, from in my, in my assessment, uh, US will stay as a very big power 
but uh, its its supremacy over China will be in decline uh, because China is catching up very fast. China is growing faster than the United States. So I think in order to maintain the same deterrence level of our alliance, Japan-U.S. Security Alliance, Japan has to do more. That's that's the most important thing, as Dave was mentioning. I, I think we, we need to have more defense spending, um, even before being told by the United States. I think we are, we are trying to increase our defense spending substantially in the coming years, and we need to have a better weapon system. And uh, this, once again, corresponds to Dave's point. Um, I, I think Japan will try to become pivot for establishing network of cooperation among allies and like-minded countries. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next slide. And more regional and global engagement, like what we did for Afghanistan, and plus what we will do for Taiwan is needed. I think that's for the sake of the alliance and for the sake of Japan. And the Ukraine is perhaps also an important part of the game, because you know the, the China is watching what we US and allies and partners do uh, for Ukraine. And they, are, they will take in that into consideration if and when uh, China wants to do something about Taiwan. So we need to stay united, uh, knowing that China is watching it. And even Russia, Russia has a two faces, a big bear with two faces, as they increase their military activities on the Western Front uh, facing with Europe. I think their act military activities in Eastern Front has been activated as well. So I think we, we are interconnected in the small world. Now, at the same time, US needs to maintain, strengthen, and implement engagement in India, I mean, in, in Asia. And uh, from that viewpoint, I repeat uh, myself, uh, saying that, uh, that we do welcome the issuance of the new uh, US uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. And, uh, but I think the important thing is uh, what you do more than what you say. And particularly, economic integration will be the key to show in a tangible way uh, your, your interest and your, your seriousness about your engagement in Asian Pacific. So I hope uh, your new uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework uh, comes out uh, uh, soon uh, with some details to be filled in. And uh, we are happy to help uh, or whenever you need help. So once again, Without economic uh, part of your engagement in the region, I think that the uh, spectators in the region will not take you seriously. Please bear that in mind, whatever difficult it is. I hope you can do that. Now, second uh, uh, common challenge is uh, coexist with China, as uh, Dave spent uh, almost all part of his presentation, um, while achieving free and open Indo-Pacific. <laughs> Um, you may know that uh, Japan happened to be born uh, as a neighbor of uh, China, and uh, in the past 2000 years, China has been stronger, more developed, uh, bigger than Japan, and uh, the, the most important objective of Japanese foreign policy has been in the past 2000 years to, is to coexist with China happily and prosperously while maintaining independence. We don't, we don't want to be told uh, what to do by anybody, including China, and in, including by the United States, by the way. So uh, for that, we need to do a lot of homeworks. <laughs> First, consolidated core partnership. Uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, we can't go it alone. Uh, so the, I think, quote, Japan, US, India, Australia is, uh, is uh, most important and uh, most prominent core partnership uh, for, for us to maintain free and open Indo-Pacific. And the second summit meeting will be held in Japan in the first half of this year. And I hope uh, coronavirus uh, situation will allow the visit, physical visit of uh, President Biden to Japan. Number two is establish majority among new G7. As I said, new G7 will be Japan, Indonesia, uh, sorry, China, US, India, Japan, Indonesia, uh, Europe, and Russia, right? So 
In order to establish majority among new G7, I hope we can count on you, United States and Japan, and Europe will be with us. On the other side, I'm afraid China and Russia stay, stay, tend to stay away from us. So two countries left in between are India and Indonesia. So which side India and Indonesia will get closer will be the key for establishing majority under the new G7 situation. So it's, it's crucially important for us to engage both India and Indonesia an inch closer to our side. And beyond that, engage like-minded partners, uh, as Dave was trying to say, along our crucial sea lines of communication. And uh, ASEAN is very important. Uh, ASEAN is uh, as a central law, but among ASEAN countries, I think we, we need to be a little bit uh, uh, nuanced in choosing uh, those countries who are more ready to be with us. And uh, I would say big three, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines. I don't, I haven't lost the trust on the Philippines. Uh, Philippines is after all the treaty allies of the United States. And uh, don't worry, I, I think they know, they know how to deal with the United States. They know the importance of the United States. So I think you, you should not forget the importance of the Philippines. It, it, it's, it's, it's crucial to engage the Philippines and Vietnam. These three countries have more than 100 million uh, population, uh, the big, big three among the ASEAN 10 countries and who are ready to rely on Japan and the United States at a time of crisis. Uh, and, and Singapore, of course, Singapore is, Singapore hosts two US naval ships since uh, 1990, uh, which gives you a crucial uh, visiting port and uh, maintenance facilities. So these four countries among the ASEAN 10 will, will are ready to get a little bit closer to us uh, in comparison with other countries. So we should be able to respond to uh, their wish. Then, <coughs> Uh, it is it uh, strengthen partnership among democracies, engage European aspirants, particularly France and UK, and uh, Canada from the other side of the Pacific. I, I understand uh, there are a few Canadian uh, participants in this uh, seminar, which shows the level of interest of uh, Canada to a free and open Indo-Pacific, which we welcome very much. We have done a few joint exercises among our navies. Uh, so I, I think Canada, I, I should mention Canada is one of the most important allies and partners in achieving uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Then easy to say with one line, maintain Taiwan. Uh, I can spend the whole hour to explain what we do, but I, I'll leave that to the questions. And while engaging China to tackle common challenges, as I said, uh, you, you can choose friends, but you cannot choose your neighbor. And Japan has to coexist with China while maintaining independence. So wherever we have a common interest, uh, we are happy to work together with China. And uh, of course, we compete with each other most of the time, but where we can cooperate, we cooperate. I think th that's how diplomacy works. Last slide. Um, well, ready for North Korea and beyond. Once again, easy to say, I, I don't have much time left to talk more details about the North Korea. But one thing I want to say is, uh, in addition to uh, real and present the threat North Korea presents now, we should be better prepared for eventual unification of the Korean Peninsula. Because I don't, it's my view that uh, the country uh, with that kind of system may not last forever. Then proactive co proactively cope with new challenges, cyber, pandemic, climate, AI, recycling oriented economy, plus space, as uh, Peter was mentioning, I, I think the subject of the next uh, the, this webinar is, is, uh, is uh, space, which is very timely. And last but not least, wild card. What should we do about Russia? Um, I think, I, I just pose a question at the end of my, my presentation. What should be a priority among bad guys? There are a few bad guys, but can we deal with all of them? I think in my view, uh, the most difficult challenge to deal with is China. And of course, Russia is a challenge, but uh, we need to prioritize. 
So if there's any way to get uh, Russia an inch away from China, I think we should try doing it. And even during uh, uh, Ukraine crisis, uh, they had a joint, uh, well, they had a summit meeting, uh, China-Russia summit meeting, which uh, ended up issuing uh, in English translation, 5,003, more than 5,300 words of a joint statement. Uh, China supported uh, the Russian position of, uh, of uh, being against the, the further expansion of NATO, but uh, I didn't find a word about Ukraine even only one mentioning of Ukraine in that more than 5,000 joint statement. And it will be difficult for China to support the military invasion of Russia into Ukraine, because that will open up uh, very difficult possibilities for China. So I, I think there are ways to get them an inch away from each other. But for that, we need to be really careful and articulated in, in pursuing our uh, diplomatic uh, objectives. Sorry, that's the end of my presentation. Thank, thank you for being with me. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ishii. This uh, and <clears throat> Ambassador Ishii, thank you so much to both of you for the uh, your presentations. At this time, uh, I believe we can maybe transition into. Um, there's a few discussion points that I was hoping to potentially ask the two of you, but we already have some amazing questions that have come in already. So perhaps we can meld this into uh, setting the stage for a discussion between the two of you to uh, tackle a few topics that have, there are some commonalities here in the Q and A. Um, to give uh, everyone a little bit of time, perhaps to write their questions if you can in Q and A, we'll do our best to address as many as we can. I was hoping to ask the both of you uh, about the topic that you both talked about in different ways during your presentations and uh, are immediately tied to your own experiences um, in foreign service, and that is uh, Southeast Asia and its relation to uh, the US-Japan um, partnership and agreements. Um, Ambassador Shear, you talked about the defense line and how um, Southeast Asia is positioned within that. Ambassador Ishii, you mentioned um, the economic power that is growing uh, there. So I wonder if, uh, if you two wouldn't mind um, recognizing this is a completely different webinar in and of itself, um, perhaps uh, speaking a little bit about how uh, Southeast Asia fits into the US-Japan uh, partnership uh, specifically. Great. Okay. Uh, me? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, actually, the core part of free and open Indo-Pacific is to secure the freedom and safety of navigation throughout the most important sea lines communication, not only for Japan and the United States, but also China. In order to do that, we need the uh, existence of uh, reliable partners and allies en route. So while, as I said, the unity, supporting the unity of ASEAN as a whole will continue to be the most important uh, objective of our foreign policy in Southeast Asia. You need to be nicer to those who are more ready to rely on us. And the result of the opinion poll Jap Japanese foreign ministry has uh, carried out uh, uh, annually, uh, biannually, I think, uh, the, those countries who are ready to rely on us consistently are only three. As I said, Indonesia, the Vietnam, and the Philippines. Thailand, important, but they swing. Malaysia, important, but they swing. Cambodia, Laos, I'm afraid they are closer to the other side, which is understandable. So, of course, you should be nice to every one of them. But when it comes to the crucial relation for securing uh, freedom and uh, safety of navigation, um, I think we need to be choosy. We need to do a little bit more to those three big three countries plus, uh, plus Singapore. That's, that's one, one element. And the, se the second element, which will be the last, is, as I said, to form majority in new G7 situation around 2040 to 2050. The, to get India and Indonesia closer to us will be the key. So in, 
in carrying out this free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, we should bear that in mind. And uh, it may be difficult from the United States to see this trend, but if you are on the ground, you see a definite tendency of closer relation between India and Indonesia. Two big guys, they are talking to each other, which is very good to us. India is getting closer to us. India, Indonesia closer to us. Indonesia has been close to Japan. So they are now in the web of network, a uh, little bit closer to us. So I, I think we need to support that as well as a part of an important part element of our foreign policy. Sorry, too long. Yeah, before I talk about Southeast Asia, I wanna comment briefly on what um, uh, Ambassador Ish Ishii just said. And if you listen closely, he's talking about how we order our relationships with other countries in order to get what we want, in order to advance our interests. And that's what, that's what leaders do in diplomacy at the strategic level. They think about how we can use our alliances, how we can use our partnerships, and how we can order our relationships with other countries to get what we want. And that means bringing them together and generating diplomatic mass. And we, we have big advantages uh, in having these long established alliances in which we have a very high level of trust. I haven't written off the Philippines yet. I think we need to keep working together with Japan um, to ensure that the Philippines can pursue its interests, its own interests, vis-a-vis -vis China and vis-a-vis -vis the region as vigorously as it can. Um, uh, and we, we engage the Philippines frequently to that end. So um, diplomacy at the strategic level is about manipulating your relationship with other countries to get what you want. And that's what we do at the strategic level as diplomats. And then we, we go out and, and try to pursue, try to, try to, try to um, work those, those relationships. Um, with regard to Southeast Asia, as, as Ambassador Ishii says, it's, it's of increasing importance. Um, I think he said that uh, ASEAN, the 10 ASEAN countries are gonna be the fourth largest economy by 2030. Indonesia will be the fourth, itself will be the fourth largest country by 2050. It's an increasingly important region. People my age on the American side just spent the 70s and 80s trying to forget Southeast Asia, but it's back. And you can, you can, uh, you can say that you don't have interest in Southeast Asia, but Southeast Asia is gonna be interested in you. So um, we need to start now working those relationships uh, to, uh, to advance our own interests. Um, and and um, I, I, again, the Americans tend to wanna do everything themselves, but Japan has an extremely strong and influential position in Southeast Asia, built on decades of very, very intensive economic interaction, high levels of trade and Japanese investment in the region. They understand the Southeast Asians a lot. Uh, and we can learn from how the Japanese do diplomacy uh, in the region. So if, if the United States, if that line of defense is a little fuzzy in Southeast Asia, we've still got Japan and Australia and India all engaged and uh, it pays for us to cooperate. Uh, don't worry, Dave. I, I think uh, they like you. They like they like the United States, Southeast Asians. They like a strong, they uh, strong, strong partner. So they I think, of course, they like Japan too. But uh, they they like Japan coming with the United States. And uh, the, she, the one thing that separates uh, us from uh, China and uh, Russia is China and Russia. They only have each other to rely on. They have nobody else to rely on. Why are the situation different for you and for us? You have allies and partners. You, you don't have to do everything by yourself. I, I think you are in a much, much stronger position than, than they are. So be confident that includes the support coming from Southeast Asian countries to you. Oh, come on, come on, Masa. They, the Chinese can rely on Cambodia, you know that. Give me an argument. 
what I mean is that meaningful allies, meaningful allies who have intention and capabilities to support you in a tangible way. I don't think China has no, nobody else but Russia. Good point. Thank you both very much. Um, time both to a question that I was going to ask, but also has come up in some of the questions that came up in the question and answer uh, related to countries that have historical ties to both of ours, perhaps the approaches are slightly different. Um, and within the same geographic realm, that is Taiwan. Because Taiwan is, of course, another player in this trilateral uh, relationship between the United States, Japan, uh, and um, China. And it's a constantly evolving conversation um, and situation. And while it may not be in the news necessarily right now, because things in, in the Ukraine have taken a little more priority is still something I believe is on the minds of, of diplomats and um, strategic minds of both countries. I wonder if you two wouldn't mind speaking of the current, we're not going to talk about the current state of Taiwan, perhaps where the United States Japan relationship uh, currently uh, is positioned specifically in regards to Taiwan. Can I, can I start with that? First of all, um, as I mentioned in my remarks, I think, I think um, the situation in Taiwan Strait, Strait is basically stable. It's stable because um, both China and the United States are successfully deterring each other. Um, and um, we have successfully encouraged uh, the Taiwan <coughs> political elite not to overtly seek independence. So the United States has played an important role here, not only in deterring a Chinese invasion across the strait, but deterring Taiwan political elites from taking the <coughs> independence option. And the longer we can maintain that situation, the better, but it's gonna take strength and deterrence, both on the American side and in cooperation with our Japanese ally. And I think, I think uh, Taiwan is gonna become an increasingly important issue for the US-Japan <laughs> alliance. And it doesn't mean that we're going to go to war, but in order to maintain stability, in order to maintain peace in the Taiwan Strait, we all need a str strong deterrence. And to do that, we're gonna need more Japanese contributions to that effort. I, I completely agree with Dave. Um, well, my bottom line is uh, if we have something uh, along the Taiwan Strait, all of us will be a loser. Nobody wins. So I think we need to avoid that at all costs. And we have a fair chance to, for doing that. But a uh, little bit, one addition to what they mentioned is that the situation is getting a little bit tougher uh, from the Chinese side. Problem of the uh, autocracy system is that uh, they don't have election. The leadership doesn't have any uh, base for the, the legitimacy of their being there. The, the, for them, the, the, the Communist Party, right? It, it hasn't been too difficult for them to justify their presence because of the more than 10% GDP growth for more than 10 years. That was quite enough for them to justify their presence. But now the list of items for justification is getting shorter and shorter. And among them, I think uniting big China is a very, very big source of legitimacy which they are more and more tempted to use. But the other side of the coin is that that means they can never fail in doing so. If they fail, that is the end of Communist Party. So by giving them a sense that there's a little bit of risk involved for them in doing so, that's enough to deter them from doing it. So that's where we, need, we, we interact. I mean, Japan and the US should do more for the preparation of military contingency in Taiwan, not to fight war, but to stop China from thinking about it. We can show that to, to China that there's a risk involved. So for that purpose, I think we do need a strategic communications, not, not only on media, but behind the scene, very quiet, strategic, 
uh, communication through a trusted line, telling them that this is what we are doing. So don't do it because you you will be hurt. We'll be hurt too, but you will be hurt more. So I think we do, we should do that with China, and we should do that as they mentioned with Taiwan as well. Of course, we support Taiwan. We will be most likely militarily engaged if something happens because U.S. has a base and uh, uh, in Japan. Will you know it makes sense for China to attack U.S. bases in, in Okinawa for fighting the war. So we'll be part of the war. So we, we should be ready and we should engage. We are ready to engage, but nobody wants to see this. So try to get acquire armament that can easily deter China from doing it. And don't announce independence, which will be passing the red line for China. So, and at the same time, we will support Taiwanese to maintain their breathing space, their pride as a big democracy partner. So for that, I think admitting them into CPTPP will be one of the most important elements, giving them a sense that they are treated fairly, they are part of the game. I think we need to do that. If there are some other ideas for giving them a sense of breathe, more breathing space, we're happy to do. Let me um, let me just um, expand on that a little by talking about Chinese intentions. I think the Chinese would prefer to reunify with Taiwan peacefully over time to win without fighting, as Sunzi said. Um, uh, and the fact that we continue to have a strong deterrent and that the Chinese are deterred from um, mounting military operations across the strait um, accentuates the Chinese interest in, in winning without fighting. And they're doing that in three ways. They're trying to do that in three ways. One is they're using military forces to intimidate the Chinese by increasing their operations in the vicinity of Taiwan and in the Taiwan Strait. Lots of military flights, lots of warships, uh, Chinese warships around Taiwan these days. So they're using that to intimidate the and demoralized the people on Taiwan. They're using their economic ties with Taiwan to increase Taiwan's uh, economic dependence and hopefully Taiwan can, can avoid that over time. And thirdly, they're using information operations in Taiwan itself to subvert Taiwan opinion. And we can help the Taiwans, the people on Taiwan um, uh, uh, counter this by reassuring them, not only militarily, but by helping them, as, um, as Masa says, helping them uh, join inter multilateral organizations like the Trans-Pacific Partnership by, by uh, increasing our contacts with them. Um, we, we don't need to do so in a way that, that, um, that antagonizes the Chinese, but we can do so in a way, we can still do so in a way that reassures our, China, our Taiwan friends. Once, once uh, two ambassadors start speaking, you can never stop them. You know, uh, yes. just one one addition to your point. Um, you know, time is not on Chinese side. I, I, that's my sense. Uh, Dave knows better than I do that the Taiwanese uh, universities uh, have been carrying out uh, opinion polls among Taiwanese. Question is, what is your identity? Are you Taiwanese or are you Chinese or are you both Taiwanese and Chinese? Used to be the case that. Uh, Chinese and Taiwanese or Chinese was far more than the majority. But now about 80% of them say that they are Taiwanese. Only 5% of say that they are Chinese. And the number of those who identify themselves as Taiwanese is increasing constantly. So I think China knows this. That, that, that is one element that worries me a little bit in terms of the timing of uh, Chinese adventure in, involving Taiwanese because, and having uh, after all what they did with, with Hong Kong, I don't think uh, one country, two system would never work with Taiwanese. <laughs> so so I, I think that, that is another element of source of worry for me. Time is not on their side. That means we, we should uh, stay with, we should bear with them. We should strengthen our deterrence power so that uh, we buy time for them to finally, they have to give up. 
in the recognition of time, and unfortunately, there's so many topics that have come in, and I would know it's it's it. There's actually nice energy here because, um, obviously, we're talking about um, many geographic um, disturbances or hot points that have developed, and we cannot talk about such things without addressing the other major. Um, elephant in the room, both literally in terms of the news, but also physically in terms of the space whenever we are looking at uh, that part of the world, and that is Russia. Um, there has been a discussion of the Russian-Chinese alliance. Um, there's a couple of questions um, asking a little more about that as it relates. But of course, there's the Ukraine and how that the current situation and the volatility of everything and with not quite knowing how things are going to move um wouldn't mind if you would mind speaking perhaps specifically how the current uk situation can uh, how it impacts um us japan relations as it relates to their own negotiations and um of the russian uh relationship with the chinese relationship but also with the european partners that exist and are impacted by the current situation If I may, um, I've been watching the the Ukraine crisis quite closely because I think it has a, a an immediate effect on our position in in the Indo Pacific. Um, partly because uh, it how Ukraine turns out will have a big effect on the future of Russo Chinese relations. Um, if it turns out in a way that's difficult for both the United States and Russia, it's likely that Russo-Chinese relations will grow closer, despite the fact that there's a great deal of mistrust on, historical mistrust on both sides. Um, and secondly, this relates to American strategic priorities. We pledged in 2011, President Obama pledged in 2011 to rebalance our uh, priorities globally after, as we pulled out from Afghanistan in Iraq. And he pledged to, to shift those priorities and the resources we expend in pursuing them to East Asia. And his success in doing that was only partial. President Trump's success in doing it was only partial. So this is a, a long-term effort. And to the extent that we continue to have difficulties with Russia in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, um, our attention and our resources will be um, siphoned away from the real strategic priority, which is the Indo-Pacific and our allies and cooperating and competing and if necessary, confronting China. Okay, um, number one, we, we are with the United States in dealing with Ukraine. Uh, it's not what's happening far away from us. It has a relevance in many senses. Number one, it's a challenge to the unanimously accepted uh, international principle, right? No unilateral uh, change of the status quo by force. If we allow that, that can happen in other part of the world, including Taiwan or wherever it is. And the, uh, the Indo-Pacific side. So we have to be hard on this. We have to be consistent on this. So I think in terms of sanctions and others, we will be firmly with the United States and other allies and partners. We are going to have G7 uh, summit meeting soon. Uh, so we'll be together with you. Um, but having said that, number two, I, I think as we have to live with China, we have to live with Russia as well on this part of the world. Russia has two faces. Russia is a Pacific power as well. And uh, as I said, uh, if we have to prioritize among uh, the, the, the enemies or potential adversaries, I think I would say China is more difficult challenge than, the, than, than Russia. And uh, we have not normalized fully our relation with Russia which has been on our agenda for the past uh, few decades. And we will continue to pursue that because I believe that is part of the game to 
uh, get Russia an inch away from China. I'm not saying uh, we can get uh, Russia completely away from China because as I said, there's nobody else to rely on for Russia. But if we get them an inch away, uh, if we succeed in uh, making the calculation on the part of China more complicated and more difficult by opening up uh, some theoretical possibilities of improvement of our relation with Russia, that will be uh, some element in uh, foreign policy in dealing with, uh, with China. And you know, India is, uh, is very relevant in that regard as well. While Russia is very close to China, Russia is trying to be close to India as well. Their, their, their military cell between the two countries is very big. And uh, I think it makes sense for Russia for getting closer to India, in addition to getting very close to China, because uh, if China is the only friend, Russia will stay as the complete junior partner in relation with China. Growing power, declining power, uh, nothing else but energy to sell and advanced economy and so on and so forth. So I, th I think that that is completely against the Russian DNA. They need to have at least a theoretical option. And I think part of the game in that regard from Russia is India. So, you know, uh, we've been actually uh, talking about the possibility of having a track to uh, dialogue mechanism among Russia, India, and Japan. That sounds very interesting because we do have one common thing to discuss about. Track two means non-official. Including us. Right. <laughs> well, unfortunately, while we've not been able to get to all the the questions uh, because there's some amazing ones and some very detailed ones. Uh, we are unfortunately coming to the end of our time. Um, so once again, I just wish to um, very much thank our speakers, um, Ambassador Shear, Ambassador Ishii, thank you so much for your insights and perspectives and updates. Uh, we can read about it in the news. We can uh, watch it on television or however else we're getting our news today, but to be able to talk about people who have lived it and been in the region is an invaluable resource. So thank you both so much uh, for being able to join us um, today from again, from both sides of the Pacific. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Najas or Peter for being with us tonight, as well as the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I saw um, Rata-san as well as others from Sasakawa Peace Foundation and our attendees tonight. So thank you so much for uh, your support of not only this uh, program, but also ge the geo strategies and the grassroots programs that are going on um, elsewhere amongst the NAJAS network this year. Uh, once again, we have we have Southern California, uh, Southern Colorado, my apologies, Southern Col Colorado and Pennsylvania and Atlanta coming up in the next month. So we hope that if you enjoyed this conversation, you can check those out as well. Um, and finally, uh, thank you so much to Ohio State University Institute for Japanese Studies for um, for serving as uh, co-sponsors uh, and uh, and presenters of tonight's presentation. Uh, even though we were not able to do something in person at OSU, we were able to facilitate a conversation um, between the ambassadors and some of the faculty and students of OSU uh, prior to today's webinar, and we're able to set up a conversation between Ambassador Ishii and some of the higher level Japanese language students as well. So thank you so much to uh, Janet Fukumori Sensei, uh, Mitch Lerner, and everyone else uh, out there for your support. And finally, to everyone who's in attendance today, thank you so much for joining us, whether it's the end of the day or the beginning of the day for you. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we hope you have a lovely evening. Uh, we will be sending out a just a brief survey about this. You either get move to it immediately after leaving this webinar or you'll receive it in the next 24 hours. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us and we hope you have a lovely weekend. Thank you all very much. <laughs>